Back to our second FGCC comments and Q&A. And we're picking up where we left off. The last comment I read was from Eric, who also goes by Ineffable on Tremegistus 4 into 0. Next is Paul Bailey, who says, Welcome back. So, Paul, thank you very much for continuing with FGCC. Richard, great to see you here. You say, I, for one, am beyond excited to hear from you again, Thomas. Thank you, and I'm very excited that you are continuing with us, Richard, as I always have enjoyed your ongoing comments and conversations with different members of FGCC. Mikey Pope says, wow, 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 I said the Jesus prayer yesterday for the first time, multiple times, and look what happened. Welcome back, bro. Thank you for your prayers and... Thank you for continuing with FGCC. Avinda REV says, Did you finally see the light about politics? So Avinda is referring to my previous history where I was, in fact, interested in politics and considered going into politics. But it's not that I believe politics doesn't have answers, as I do think if you have really good politicians in office and they are serving the public, as was intended by the Founding Fathers, then they can get a lot done. And in this realm, as Christ himself said, pay your homage to Caesar. And I would say definitely vote, because we can make a difference while we're in this realm. So it isn't simply that we wait to live our lives out in the Pleroma or in the Holy Souls realm in the afterlife, but this is the place in which we are practicing how to manage ourselves and our environment and interact with people so that we learn how to manage. You can consider this as sort of, um, you know, the grade school, and we are learning how to graduate into middle school. Uh, it would be the Holy Souls realm, and then high school would, of course, be graduating eventually into the Pleroma. I do think that politics is neither good or bad like anything else. It's what we make of it. What I find unfortunate in today's world, you have the vast majority of politicians that are self-serving. And we have to continue to work to uh, ensure that that become something that it was intended to be. And it isn't something you just do once and then it's permanent, but you have to continually work on it. But to answer your question in a more specific way, personally, my uh, passion and my calling is not politics. And it did take me some having to wrangle through that to make that determination. Uh, but maybe some people are called to do that. And I think if they do it in a pure form, it's ultimately going to serve the evolution or the ascendancy of themselves and mankind or humankind. Then that, in my opinion, is a healthy thing to do. But I find politics personally, maybe rather it be speaking about or commenting on it or it being a politician to be something that isn't particularly something that I was most passionate about, and therefore it was not necessarily healthy for me. The spirituality, the calling to found this church and to grow this church is what ultimately one of the great passions I have. So therefore, that's what I've been called to do. Thank you for your great comment here and being with us here at FGCC. The Rebel Preacher says, awesome information. Thank you, Rebel. Perhaps you have your own church, so I'll check out your channel. At some point, I'm going to be inviting people into uh, some type of Zoom call, but there will be a vocal interchange between us, so that should be very interesting. And perhaps, Rebel, you could be included in that if you are interested. You can certainly just message me at firstgnosticchurchofchrist at gmail.com. And thank you for being with us. Brian W., thank you for continuing with us here at FGCC. You say very thankful for your return. Thomas, missed you. And also missed you guys. Obviously, you know, just me returning is indicative that Christ has called me to have a connection with each one of you. And Ineffable says thanks. And I think he's probably referring to another comment or he's referring to something not commented on the first FGCC Q&A comment video. Mike Q., says, you are very interesting. I look forward to your future videos. Thank you, Mike, for the compliment. Hopefully you mean that in a complimentary way. I agree with your statement that the light of God indwells all beings. Amen on that. The light of God is within us, even Christ said, the hope of glory. Christ is within, which is the hope of glory. I left Christianity in 1980 at 20 years old. From that point to 35 years old in 1994, 
was what I might call an incubation period. And yes, that is a beautiful analogy or metaphor because that's exactly when we can speak truth that people can relate to on a very subliminal level is when we talk in terms of metaphors. Then on October 9, 1994, I crossed the threshold into conscious meditation, insightful introspection. I like this because this is exactly what mindfulness is that Paul talked about, Christ talked about when he talked about be at peace, talking about being in the moment, being in a prayerful or meditative state. This is exactly part of what is the way, the truth, the light, the walk that Christ talked about. And I see this as a very significant day for you as you literally indicate and remember the date down to a T, that period that you found equilibrium and harmony within peace within yourself. Uh, in this particular case, maybe coincidental, under the Librian sun. This is the time of Libra. My nugget of wisdom for the world, draw from within. You are the Tao, the living scriptures. This is uh, filled with all kinds of Gnostic truth. First off, you talk about Sophia, wisdom for the world, draw from within. And that's exactly what Sophia represents, is the inner wisdom that lies in us, that is a quiet truth that we, through osmosis, uh, absorb simply by experiencing existence quietly. Our brain, our body absorbs truth, and it's unadulterated because we have nothing conscious to filter it out. Uh, that's at the subconscious, unconscious level. So that's where wisdom lies. And then you say you are the Tao, and that is another way of saying you are God, Dio, Tao, that there's they basically derive from that same root, the living scriptures. And here you're hinting at two parts of the Bible. One, Genesis, which is in the beginning was heaven and earth, and God said, let there be, and then everything was. And so essentially, he spoke existence. So when we're talking about scriptures, really we're just talking about what's being scribed, scripted from whatever is oral or whatever is literally being behaved or existing through some kind of written form. So it's another way of saying manifesting into action, thoughts, really. That's really all, scripting uh, our thoughts into being. And that is true. We are exactly that. Just as Christ said in John, that second or implication, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word came among men, and men knew it not, indicating that Christ is the living Scripture. He is the Word of God. The Bible is not the Word of God, and neither is the Gnostic text the Word of God. They are scriptures that inspire about God or of God or f from God, but they are not, in fact, the living word. You are that living word. Christ was that living word. The Christ within you is that living word. So this is excellent. The knowledge of source is within you. Absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to upload. It's a joy to listen to you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for being with us, and welcome to FGCC. David Stanley says, David, thank you for continuing FGCC and just your incredible input to our channel has enriched everyone's experience here and this awesome amount of knowledge you, you continually share with us. The necessary evil, separation and division, that's really what it is, where we get the word devil and divide, division, they all come from, stem from the same word. And also, by the word divine, also stems from the same word that we get devil. But that's another conversation for another time. But evil ultimately in Gnosticism is understood the thing that divides. Uh, because, again, evil comes from the same root word. We get the word even, or to even up, equilibrium. Really, again, which is hinting at the knowledge uh, of good and evil. Reality, uh, when you look at it, they really are not separated. It's that in this realm... The powers that be have used the one side against the other so that we would be divided and there would not be unity and we could not see the truth of the whole. But that inevitability that you're talking about, I don't believe it's because it was inevitable that we suffer in this realm, but it was inevitable that we have a will and we all chose, all of us here that is, chose to experience our ascendancy in this realm. That part, God didn't intend from the beginning. All God intended, or the emanator intended, was that we all have a will. But it was not necessary that will come about through this incarnation. But we chose that uh, through wanting wisdom. Now, it, era, 
was bound to occur eventually. The other part that I find interesting when you talk about this evil being inevitable is at the very beginning God was, and in order for God to show that we are individuals and we have a will of our own separate from God, even though we are a part of God and God is a part of us, is that we first understand what we are not. So that's when you're referring to error, and that comes out of darkness or ignorance was bound to occur eventually. And I think this is what you're referring to. And then you provide some scriptures here because the Father can never be known in the fullness as the scriptures declare. So yes, ultimately, uh, all of these things lead to suffering and they are a result of just ignorance. The first thing that ignorance tends to uh, birth is fear. Jesus also said in John 4.24 that God is spirit and as such requires worship in spirit and in truth. So when we talk about the word worship in Gnosticism, we are referring to something very different from what canonical texts would indicate when they say the word worship. First off, it's important that we understand the etymology of the word worship. So let's take a look here. It simply means condition of being worthy, dignity, glory, distinction, honor, renown. Worthy. Now, you would think that when you go through the orthodox understanding of the word worship, it would mean groveling at your knees and ingratiating God, and kissing up to God, and bowing before God, and, and that you are not worthy. And so it's a very opposite of what the actual word means. Worthy and worship are the same word. That's what it means, to honor, to make worthy. And so, now that we understand that, let's read this again. As such, requires worthiness in spirit and in truth. So, in other words, for you to receive the good news... You must first believe you are worthy of God's love. That's simple. And that's what Christ came to do. He came to remind you that contrary to everything that the Old Testament God told you, that you have to work to get God's love. And you have to do it per a set of dictates that are very restrictive and also very hateful and destructive and murderous. You know, stone someone that speaks back to their mother or father or if you mix fabrics, or if you eat shellfish. These are things that you are going to be condemned and you are instigated to pick up stones against your neighbor and literally mash your heads against rocks. Now that's a very violent understanding of what God actually is and would suggest you're not worthy of God's love unless you do exactly what that God says down to the T. And it's literally the size of the head of a needle that you have to push yourself through. But Christ came to show that that is the false father. That is not even a father. That's not really the God of the universe that emanated everything. But in fact, God is showing you that you, just by being brought into existence, are worthy. And so for you to really understand the good news and to have the Gnostic moment and to return to the Father, you must first believe that you are worthy of being with the Father, Mother, and the Pleroma, and you are worthy of that love. So that's what it means when it talks about worshiping God. It doesn't mean groveling before God and bowing down. That would indicate that you think you're unworthy and that God's going to somehow, you know, just, I don't know, by his goodwill, decide some people are worthy and some are not because of how they behaved in this realm. All right. Spirit is what we know as mind. Now, here's where you get into mind versus thought. So my understanding of Gnostic texts, we agree principally there is a mind and thought, but the attribution, we have a difference. And that's okay. I'm not here to tell everybody to follow me and my interpretation of FGCC. I'm here to share my interpretation. And everybody then can uh, meditate on that and decide whether they understand it that way as well. But the difference here is that you attribute mind to father and mother to, th to thought, whereas my understanding in Austin texts in the Bible is that, in fact, the father is thought and mother is the mind. The mind is the receptacle and it receives the thought, so it's feminine. And the father is the thought, so it's the first thought and even describes that in the secret book of John. It makes it very clear that the first thought was the father. And the mother was the mind that was receptacle that was Barbello. And the bythos is, is the thought. And so, but besides that, you've seen this. And then ultimately, the last one here, the son is consciousness. That's gnosis. Consciousness is basically gnosis. It's awareness. It's epiphany. It's those moments that you have that awakening moment of truth. 
whatever it is in your life, that aha moment that wakes up and liberates you from suffering and pain. And you're that much more capable and able at that moment to move away, further away from death and suffering and pain. That's consciousness. So that is the Christ, the child that is birthed when the thought enters the mind, that stenosis enters the mind and wisdom forms it. You can't just have thought because then it becomes reckless and it goes everywhere. And you also cannot just have the mind, the receptacle, because it would just be empty and hollow and infertile. The thought enters the womb of the mind and then the mind becomes fertilized and then conceives a Gnostic moment or consciousness. So this is beautifully written here. Spirit is what we know as mind. And again, the soul is the mind. The spirit is the thought. But nonetheless... We're on the same page in terms of the terms, not necessarily what we um, attribute to those terms. What we know as mind is the soul, uh, and thought and consciousness are, are part of the spirit, so is the mind. All of those are part of the spirit. The spirit really is the driving force, so you could think of that being in everything, so in that sense we, we would agree. But the mind is the soul, and uh, the spirit is the thought, and consciousness is the Christ, or is the inception of something new, uh, rather it be a thought, or a, a concept, or uh, that's when we talk about the Immaculate Conception. It's a, a concept that comes about. And then uh, you say here the Hebrew rock, which is breath, and the Greek pneuma, which is air, are both symbolic references to the words that we speak, formed by our two-edged sword tongue that reveal our thoughts and the will and intent of our hearts. And here, again, hearts is feminine. Whereas thoughts is masculine, which we're referring to Hebrew 4.12. This is beautifully said because this all goes back to Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1. And again, in the last set of videos, uh, I talked about that the most Gnostic of the epistles were Paul. But in fact, I actually think it was John. So I'll correct myself on that. And then Father, mind, ineffable, incomprehensible, pure, and perfect. Again, I believe it's thought the way I understand scripture in which all exists and all which all is good and true. And then mind is the mother, holy, set apart, the mother of all life from which all concepts are born. When you say concepts are born, that's correct because the mother does birth those concepts. But concepts is with exception, meaning that it sets apart or it embraces this thought. So you've got with exception or embracing concept. So that's where you get conception. So it's the fact that the mother has embraced that that brings about that thought into conceiving. No thing comes into existence without thought. All right, son, consciousness, the conception of the union of father, which is thought and mother, mind, the creator of all concepts of life and being, the word, logos, revealing thought of the mother, father. And I would include um, thought and mind of the father, mother. And this is beautifully said, uh, David, yes, the word is what's being conceived in action. Really, spoken word is no different than thought. Uh, they're both articulating. When you're thinking something, you're thinking as though you're speaking words in your head. And sometimes you, you see that symbolically in images uh, and metaphors. But all of that, again, is a type of alliteration, a type of ascribing in your mind. So that's logos or thought. And thank you, David. Magus Simon says, welcome back. Thank you, Magus. I'm very happy to see that you're continuing with us. I'm going to read this last one here, and we'll pick back up. David Stanley says, life is many things, but above all, true life is sacrificial. The father of all sacrificed himself so that we can exist, and not just to exist, but to share in his love. What kind of love is this? All righty. Now, there's so much here. Uh, again, David, you, you always really, really compact your, your comments with so much truth. I really, really love this, uh, that you are with us. When you talk about sacrificial, it's important, again, to understand this word, because this is often used in Orthodox Christianity to mean something, right? So it's important that we distinguish between the way we understand the word sacrifice and the way Orthodox Christians understand the word sacrifice. And I think it's pretty clear the way Orthodox Christianity understands sacrifice. They understand it as death being required in order to please something. So whether it was Abraham uh, having to sacrifice his son to please the Jehovah God, or it was the God of the New Testament having to bring his son to earth uh, to be nailed to a cross 
to sacrifice his angriness about your sins so that your sins could be cleansed by Christ's blood. And then you would be free as long as you accepted that that offering. People basically think of sacrifice in Orthodox Christianity as a type of offering that requires some kind of suffering. So you could think of sacrifice as being literally suffering so that you can achieve some outcome. Now, how about Gnosticism? How do we understand that? Let's look at the original etymology of that word sacrifice. So let's start out by reading this sacrifice in the noun form. The offering of something to a deity is an act of propitiation or homage, etc., mid-14, that which is offered to a deity in sacrifice, from old French sacrifice, uh, sacrifice offering, and sacrifice. Now, that, that's great. That's the way it was interpreted in France back in the mid-14th century, because that's how they understood the Bible, right? Because it came from the old fathers from way back in uh, just after Christ died. But the original root of the word comes from sacra, ultimately means to make or to do. And you're combining that with secure or to make secure, to set, to put. So in other words, you're making it holy or pure or acceptable. You're making it acceptable. Essentially, you're making it sacred. And because by making it sacred, you're making it acceptable. So what are you making it acceptable for? In this case, acceptable before God. But that's what this realm requires, not what the Father in the Pleroma, the Father-Mother requires of us. That's what is most clear that we must understand. So let's go back. Now, above all, true life is sacrificial. But if we really understand the root word, not through the lens of the French in the 1400s, because their lens is 1400 years going back to the the old church fathers had a very dogmatic understanding of scripture right so but we go further back to what does that even mean it, to its etymology and its root word it means sacred to make sacred so let's reread it uh, but above all true life is sacred Do you see that it's sacred in other words it's already acceptable to the father mother there's nothing you need to do but it just so happens that in this realm, the God of this realm and everything in this realm does require death. And that's what the whole ritual was. Uh, it wasn't that the Jehovah God, or if it even was the true God, was actually requiring Abraham kill his son. But it was a ritual to indicate symbolically the nature of this realm. But he, that Jehovah God did a very rudimentary example, a very emotionally traumatizing example of what, what ultimately he was trying to convey to Abraham. That's why Christ came as a greater, much greater teacher than even Jehovah, right? To show us the truth for, for once and for all. The father of all made sacred himself, right? The father of all sacrificed himself. So the father of all did not sacrifice himself first off. Father doesn't sacrifice anything. The father mother simply is. That's all. There's nothing to sacrifice. Sacrifice would indicate the way you're trying to imply here that the father and mother had to suffer, go through something that they had to give up to suffer, you see? But that's just not the way I understand Gnostic texts. The father and mother gave everything freely and doesn't suffer anything, but is understanding and loving and graceful and, and giving. That's all. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, you could say allow... But even that is a bit harsh because the father, you know, that would indicate then there are certain things the father and mother doesn't allow. But that, in fact, is not true. Everything is allowed by the father and mother. You are total liberty, okay? Everything's permitted, as Paul says, but not all things prudent. That's, that's the other part you want to understand so that we can exist. Again, there's no sacrifice. The father and mother didn't sacrifice so we could exist. The father and mother brought everything about so there could be experiencing of love and communion. Okay, and not just to exist, but to share in his love. So that part, I don't necessarily agree with you, David, but that's fine. Again, you are at liberty to believe whatever you, you believe, and people can take from uh, your comments and my, my uh, comment to your comment, whatever they will. What kind of love is this? This is John 3.16. And when it talks about that part, when it says, let's read it word for word here, John 3.16, that the Orthodox Christians like to pull out all the time. For God so loved, you see, it doesn't say God so sacrificed. God so loved the world that he gave. He didn't sacrifice. 
he gave. And to give is just to open your hands freely and say, here. Not because the Father came up with the idea, but Christ self said that I would like to go down to complete Sophia's work. That's all. Because they're complementary, they're, they're consorts. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Now, at that point, that would be true. Christ was the one and only Son. But once Christ had resurrected and brought truth to everyone, he announced that we are all sons and daughters of God. Because what makes you a son and daughter of God is the realization that you are a son and daughter of God. Because that ultimately is the grand, most important prime directive, is not to interfere with our will. If we don't believe we're the son and daughter of God, that in, in God's eye, Father and Mother's eye, that's respected. God is not going to say you are a son and daughter, my son and daughter, if that is something that you don't even want or believe about yourself. Because the grand thing that God, the mother, father, is that respecting of your true will. So if your will doesn't believe that or think that, then that's the way the father, mother will understand you. They know differently, but they will understand according to the way you understand. At that point, it was true to say that Christ was the only one and only son at that point. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now here's the other part of it. Orthodox Christianity will have you believe that all you need to do is believe in that story. That you're a wretch, you're a sinner, that you confess with your mouth your sins, and that you literally believe that Christ walked the earth 2,000 years ago and was hung on a cross for your sins. That you just believe that, and that's it. And that, then you're going you're gonna to go to heaven and live forever and ever. But let's read this again. That whoever believes in him... Now, when you, there's two ways to understand that. You could say, I have something that I'm going to share with you. Now, you can either believe me or not believe me. You could either take that away as you believe in me as a person, simply because I shared something with you that I want you to consider if you want to believe or not. Or it could be about what I'm sharing with you, okay? Now, which is most important, that Christ came here and then he left, or that Christ came here to share something that he would hope that we'd come to understand and believe, that he knew that if you believed that, you would find the way, the truth, the light to eternal life? Well, obviously, it's the second. So it's not just simply believing the historical figure called Jesus that walked earth, but it's believing in his message, that is the most central part of everything. So that's what it's talking about. That whoever believes in his message, believes in him, meaning believes in what he's saying, what he spoke, shall not perish but have eternal life. But you're not going to have it instantly right there. It doesn't talk about, it doesn't say you will instantly not perish and instantly not have eternal life. But it will say that eventually, at some point, you will see that your spirit is eternal. Okay? That's all. That awakening, the consciousness, the conception comes, you know, the gnosis comes into the, your, your mind, the receptacle, the feminine, your feminine mind is open and receives the first thought that you are worthy and you are loved from the beginning. And this is why the father and mother brought you about from the very beginning and why Christ came to remind you of that truth and why he was therefore the first and only son of God at that point in time. That simple, nothing more, nothing less. That's how beautiful the tapestry is, you see. Okay, so thank you, David, for sharing that. And I totally agree what kind of love that is indeed. We will be picking back up with the next Q&A sometime over the next week. I hope to put out one or two of these a week so that we can get caught up. We're about 10 days behind, but we will eventually get caught up. And I will be reading everybody's comments and answering any questions anybody might have here at FGCC interpretation of the Gnostic text. And again, thank you for being with us, and we'll talk again soon.